Before I get into the subject of the video, I need to point out that I'm be playing a lot of VCS games here, and pretty much the only effect that they had going for them was flashing the screen rapidly. So if you or someone in the room is sensitive to those flashing lights, give this video a pass. I've just finished a series about the Epoch Cassette Vision, Japan's first cartridge-based video game console. It was released in 1981, had 11 games, and lasted only about three years. I'm about to start a series on the Super Cassette Vision, Epoch's follow-up that they released in 1984, and it wound up being the third-place console in Japan's console wars. But in between those two platforms was 1983, the year that Japan saw the release of eight platforms that we would consider to be video game consoles in the modern sense. Systems with interchangeable games. The most successful of these was the Famicom, which I've also done a full series retrospective of. A process that only took three years. But what about the other consoles released at that time? Well, most of them aren't especially notable, with the obvious exception of Sega's SG-1000. But there was one other system released in that period that was successful, just not in Japan. On May 10th, 1983, Atari released the Atari 2800 in Japan. The 2800 was the Atari VCS, or 2600, just in a sleeker and more modern for 1983 housing. The 2800 also came with a different style of controller, that integrated the rotary and joystick style controller into one unit. But other than that, it was the same platform as the 2600. If you went to the US and bought 2600 games there and brought them back to Japan, they'd work just fine in your 2800. When the system launched, it had a massive library of 25 games available for it right off the bat. This was because Atari just brought the US games over with no changes, and just printed new boxes and manuals for them. This wasn't the first time that the VCS was available in the country. They formerly mentioned Epoch had imported the systems from the US and distributed them there, but the packaging and style was exactly the same as the US. It was just a very expensive imported curiosity. The 2800 was Atari themselves attempting a full push into the Japanese market, and it failed spectacularly. It's not hard to understand why. A poor exchange rate meant the console and games were super expensive, and the hardware was incredibly primitive compared to what other manufacturers were putting out. This was hardware from 1977, and technology was moving fast at the time. The 2800 looked incredibly primitive compared to the weak systems of 1983 let alone putting it next to the technical powerhouse that was Nintendo's family computer. The Atari 2800 was doomed right from the start, and now it's just a tiny footnote in the annals of video game history. But there is one thing I find interesting about it, and that's what games Atari thought they could sell to the Japanese market. The 2800 library is a curated list. It should be the best and brightest of the VCS games that they were willing to put up against the latest of technology. And so what I'm going to do in this video is go through the games that Atari sold for the 2800. I'm not going to dig too deep or dwell too long on any individual title. They are, after all, games that are well documented elsewhere. Instead, just consider this to be an overview of what was coming into Japan from the US. I'm getting started with the oldest game in this launch lineup, Air Sea Battle. As a 2800 game, this one stands out because it's the only game from the 1970s that they released for the system. It's also one of the few games to get a Japanese title, Sora Umi Sento, which is just a literal translation of Air Sea Battle. For 2800 games, the title was written on the box in English, and the cartridge was the exact same as the VCS cartridge, but there was a small Japanese translation below the English title and almost all of those are just transliterations of the English title. Air Sea Battle is also the only 2800 game to have unique box art. All of the other 2800 games just use the exact same box art as their VCS counterpart. The art here gives everyone cutesy eyes. 
I suspect they commissioned new art because the original Air Sea Battle Box had a World War II era battleship on it. In terms of gameplay, Air Sea Battle is about as primitive of shooter as you can get. There's an enormous pile of mini games on it, but they're all slight variations on each other. Targets cross the screen in horizontal bands, and you're either shooting from below them, or shooting from above them. Sometimes you can aim, sometimes you can't. Sometimes you're moving and control your speed, sometimes you're stuck in one place. There's not a whole lot to it. It's also strictly a two-player game. So I guess you could play one player if you just want to run up your score. The second player is always there, though. Air Sea Battle is one of the weirdest choices to bring over for the 2800. Moving forward in time a little bit, it's Super Breakout. And Super Breakout is the sequel to Breakout. Those are separate games on the 2600. You know Breakout. You move the paddle back and forth at the bottom of the screen, keep the ball going, taking bricks out of the wall as you go. The key thing that Super Breakout adds are modes where there are additional balls bouncing around. Although Super Breakout was a 1978 arcade game, the VCS version was a 1982 game, and that's mostly what we're going to be seeing for the 2800. Except for a few relatively popular classics, the library selection for the 2800 is actually the recent hits for the system. Now that you can really tell from Super Breakout, I mean, it just looks like Breakout only a little bit better looking. And unless you knew what Breakout looked like, you really wouldn't be able to tell the difference. But the game still works pretty well. It plays fast and snappy. It's just of a style that's a little bit behind the times for 1983. And here we're hitting one of the more unfortunate games for the 2800. Atari's Golf is... Well, if you didn't have anything else, then it's kind of acceptable. And I'm being generous with that assessment. No club selection. You have to maneuver your golfer around the ball. The way that you aim doesn't really feel natural. There are two things I'd say it does right. You hold down the fire button to build up your swing and thus your power. And that's a decent interface choice. And once you reach the green, you get a zoomed-in view. Not that the greens really vary, or that there's a slope for them. You also don't get wind or club selection. Getting out of a bunker can take forever, because you can't really do anything with your swings. And the game lets you toggle whether or not your ball will be allowed to go into the rough. The best thing I can say about golf is, this was the best golf game available on a console in 1981. When it came out in 1983, though, Japan was about to get flooded with golf games. And it doesn't remotely stack up to those. Now here's the big one. The system seller. Even in the US, this was the game that put Atari over the top. Atari had exclusivity on a console port of Space Invaders. And Space Invaders was in such demand that it would be why other companies tried to gray market import VCSs before this. It doesn't have the iconic shapes, and the quantity of aliens is greatly reduced. But this is a genuinely good port of Space Invaders, with more variations on the cartridge than you can imagine. If any game was going to sell 2800 systems, it was Space Invaders. And Atari would have that exclusivity for a few years. It would be 1985 before Taito ported Space Invaders to any other system, and that port to the Famicom is not very good, even if it included Space Invaders 2 once you completed eight stages. It was really bad design all around with that port. Unfortunately for Atari, by 1983, the shine had come off of Space Invaders a bit, but more than any other release that the 2800 had, this shows that Atari was making a real effort to break through in Japan. Circus Atari is a version of Taito's Circus, which was a relatively popular arcade game in Japan in 1977. The game is essentially breakout, only the walls are moving, and you have to alternate which side of the paddle you're hitting every time. And you don't even have to do that if you use the fire button to rotate the seesaw. It's not a horrible game, but it's relying on the speed of the balloons at the top and the relatively slight character animations to sell it. In 1983, that's not going to cut it. Now we come to the real show. Most of the 2800 games were Atari's recent technical marvels, and that includes the Sword Quest games. 
I have conflicting information about these. And I think it's a situation where information about the American releases were getting mixed up with the Japanese releases. Sword Quest is a game where you're wandering a maze, looking for treasure, and collecting items to help you work your way through some mini-games. One of the big selling points of the Sword Quest games was that you could win real treasure, a golden artifact made representing each game in the series. As far as I can tell, this contest did not extend to Japan. There's no mention of the competition on the boxes at all. And while in the US, Waterworld was only available through mail order, and Airworld was never released at all, Japan got neither of those games. Earthworld was the first one in the series, though both games came out at the same time in Japan, and it's a bit more primitive than Fireworld. Fireworld at least has a more complex maze that you can wander through, and mini games that are slightly, maybe just marginally, better than Earthworld. One of the important components for the game in order to beat it was a comic, and the game would flash numbers on the screen at certain points, telling you to reference a page and panel. That comic was translated to Japanese and included with the games. Even with that help, the Sword Quest games are unplayable stinkers. Technically ambitious, especially for a console in 1983, but the minigames are almost unplayable. The Sport of Defender is one of the older games that we're going to see here, but it's also one of the more impressive shooters available. Remember that consoles in Japan in 1983 had never gotten any kind of scrolling shoot 'em up. Even the 1983 crop of consoles avoided scrolling the screens at all until the developers got used to the platforms. Atari's screen scrolling may not have been the smoothest, but they actually had it, unlike anyone else. And it doesn't hurt that Defender's a pretty good shoot 'em up for the platform. You even have the radar up top letting you spot when flying saucers are swooping in to abduct people. If that happens, you have to shoot down the flying saucer before it gets off the screen, and then catch the falling person in midair. Okay, some of the control scheme in Defender is unintuitive, like how you have to go off screen and hit fire in order to use the smart bombs, but this is a pretty effective, fast-paced action game. Its only real weakness is how chunky the graphics look. Onto every system, there must come baseball. Real Sports Baseball was part of Atari's Real Sports line, an attempt in 1982 to improve the quality of sports games on the platform. These games emphasized the graphics, which featured some really impressive characters and animation for the VCS, and making their gameplay as close to the actual sport as possible, only making the smallest compromises possible to get the game on the VCS. I've always found Real Sports Baseball to be a pain to control, which I think you can obviously tell there. It's fairly unintuitive in the timing for pitching and batting. It's a sports game that requires that someone explain to you how to play it, and that's never going to work. On top of that, Atari doesn't even get out of 1983 before there's a competitor who outdoes them in every way here. The 2800 Forge of Centipede is a game that demonstrates the dichotomy that occurs in a lot of these VCS versions. It looks ugly as sin. You can't even tell that those squares are supposed to be mushrooms. You don't have the fine control that came from the trackball that the arcade version had. But it still plays really well. You can mash that button and blast away the centipede at high speed. The spiders still do their threatening bounce around you. And the other bugs pop in to make your life miserable. This version of Centipede looks positively abstract compared to the pastel-colored arcade game, and it definitely looks uglier compared to the games showing up on other platforms at the time. But if you sit down and play it, it really feels nice. This version was made in 1982, a point when Atari had really gotten a handle on making some very good ports of arcade games. And since the 2800 library is pulled from a lot of those 1982 and 1983 releases, it's something that we're actually going to see quite a bit of here. Night Driver is another game that was very impressive for its moment in time, and not so impressive afterward. By simplifying the drawing of the roadway, the 2800 could depict some high-speed driving. And the game was simple enough to understand, drive as far as you can in the time limit. But I don't think it was as intuitive as another driving game we're going to see coming up. 
and definitely not as smooth as the driving games that will start showing up in 1984. Still, at the time of its release, there was nothing else like it that you could play in your home in Japan. Even if it is really hard to get the feel for going around some of those corners. Star Raiders is a bit of a special game. It's a fairly complicated, action-based version of the Star Trek mainframe game. You're tasked with protecting all of the bases in a sector of space, and your ship has a certain amount of energy that gets depleted whenever you're shot, fire your gun, or warp to another sector. You'll have to manage that energy going back to recharge periodically while dealing with the aliens rampaging through the area. And as part of its interface, it used a numeric keypad that plugged into the Player 2 joystick port. Very few VCS cartridges used this besides Star Raiders, but we're actually going to see a few more games that took advantage of the peripheral. Kind of. Star Raiders was also a pioneer of the cockpit view space shooter, and there wasn't anything else like it on a console at the time. The 2800 might not have been a success, but this style of game definitely struck a chord among Japanese developers, as the mid-80s had a small trend of them attempting to make their own version of Star Raiders. This version of Raiders of the Lost Ark has a pretty bad reputation among retro game fans. They can't even figure out how to get around. The thing is, Raiders has a kind of obtuse interface, and you really have to read the manual to understand it. If you do read the manual to understand it, then Raiders of the Lost Ark is actually not that difficult to complete. The things that add challenge to the game are things that are really annoying game design bits, like having an enemy that can freeze you in place for a few seconds, or having an enemy come along and steal some of your key items. Having a thief rob you of your vital inventory items is straight out of Zork. And that's the kind of adventure game that Raiders of the Lost Ark was going for. I'm not going to say it's a great game, because it really isn't, but it is wildly ambitious for this platform, and the only graphical adventure game that you'd find on any console in Japan until 1985. Asteroids is one of the games that was given an alternate Japanese title for the 2800. It's Shoyusei, which means small planet. It's also not how you say asteroid in Japanese, that would be Shoyusei which also could be transliterated as Small Planet, and points to Atari getting one of the characters in the title wrong. The original Asteroids in the arcade used vector graphics to draw lines of precise distances, rather than rely on sprites like most games. And it gave Asteroids a distinctive look that really could not be replicated on just about any home system. And similarly, the free movement of the Asteroids was constrained to being nearly vertical in this port. But I also think that this version makes good use of what the hardware could do. You get a whole lot of rocks on screen at the same time, and you can blast away to your heart's content. Maybe the worst thing about it is that the flying saucers and UFOs are blocked behind difficulty switches. So if you don't have those set appropriately, you're missing a lot of the game. The whole thing is a lot of fun, but at this point you might be noticing a real theme in Atari's 2800 selections. They really went all in with the shooters for this system. Missile Command, or Missile Soshirebu, is both another example of weird choices of localization, and a game that's shooter adjacent. In the arcade, the game had a trackball and three missile bases that you fired from, but for the version that was released on the 2800, it had one base in the middle, and of course you had to use a joystick. But targeting missiles that were incoming towards your city was still a pretty good time. The trick with the game has always been learning how to lead your shots just right, accounting for the flight time of your own missiles, and hopefully intercepting whatever is coming down. This is another case where the port doesn't look especially impressive, but it plays very well. This is one of the sharper games on the original VCS, which makes it another good choice to try to pull people in for that 2800. And we're moving into yet another shooter with Phoenix. This one is based on a single screen shooter by Taito, which meant that it was a another familiar game to Japanese audiences. The game is relatively similar to Galaxian, 
with waves of enemies spawning in and then flying down the screen to attack. Later stages have birds as the enemies and you can shoot their wings off. And at the end of the gameplay loop, there's a big flying saucer that acts as a boss. One of the earliest examples of such a thing in a video game. One of the special features of Phoenix was that you could put up a force field, and while it was up, you couldn't move, but you could still shoot and avoid damage. Phoenix is one of those games that was really well regarded in the early 80s, but has all but vanished from memory. That said, the 2800 port is extremely good. One of the best arcade ports that the system is going to see. In fact, I'd say of the games officially released for the 2800, Phoenix is just about the top. Real Sports Volleyball is our second Real Sports game, and I actually think it's the best of the Real Sports series. Yeah, I guess I'm in a bit of a positive mood in this block of games. The animations for players are pretty good for the system. The ball even has a little bit of detail on it, though it's hard to spot when it's moving this fast. And it's clearly on a beach with waves in the background. And besides looking good, it plays pretty well. You're controlling both of your players at the same time, and knocking the ball back and forth across the net is really intuitive here. Okay, you can't really jump or dive for the ball, but this is a game from 1983. Just having this much on a home system is astounding. It also does a great job of representing beach volleyball. You're not just playing Pong with funny shaped paddles. And of all the games we've seen so far, this is the one that's the best multiplayer experience. You could hand your controller to a friend, and they'd be up to speed and challenging you in seconds. But when we're talking about multiplayer experiences, you don't get more classic than Warlords. Or Tatakao Shogun, to use the subtitle on the box. Which could be literally translated as Warring Generals. Warlords was one of the monster hits on the VCS, which makes it a natural pick to bring to Japan. And the game is elegant in its simplicity. It's breakout in reverse. You have to use your paddle to protect your blocks, and hopefully smash it into other people's blocks. Up to four players can go at once, and the game plays fast enough that even when you knock someone out fast, they'll be in for the next round a minute later. Unfortunately, the 2800 didn't have a whole lot of games where you could go head-to-head -head against another human opponent. More often it was alternating players going for score. So that's one place where Atari missed a potential opportunity. Well, the Love Fest had to end sooner or later. Every system has to have its educational game, and Math Grand Prix, or Sansu Grand Prix, is the one for the 2800. It's essentially a board game where you pick how far you want to move, then solve a math problem to see if you get to stay there. Some squares let you move extra spaces or take another turn. Even as a kid, I would have found this one boring. As an adult, there's absolutely no reason to even look at it. Demons to Diamonds, or Demon Kara Diamond, which means in Japanese that the demons come from diamonds, is another shooter, and our last head-to-head -head competition game. Yeah, I kind of lumped them all together here. Now, I've got to say, Demons to Diamonds was never one of my favorite VCS games. I always found it a bit frustrating how some of the demons just turned into skulls and fired back at you immediately. That happens if you shoot a demon whose color doesn't match you, but it's not really an intuitive thing in the game. One thing that I do like in it is how when you hold down the fire button, it slowly extends up the screen, and then it goes away instantaneously when you release it. They give Demons to Diamonds a very different feel from other shooters. If you shoot the correct colored demon, then they become diamonds, not come from diamonds, and you can get those for extra points. In multiplayer mode, there's a ship at the top and bottom of the screen, and both players are working simultaneously, plus can steal each other's diamonds. Demons to Diamonds was the last hurrah for the old-style Atari shooter, where enemies always moved in horizontal bands that were colored across the screen. So regardless of any gameplay changes, this is one of the more primitive feeling games for the 2800. Another adventure game pops up with Haunted House, a game that I always had trouble getting into as a kid, though I can recognize the quality here. You're exploring a mansion that has six rooms per floor, and your goal is to locate the three pieces of an urn and make your way back to the exit. 
The house is dark, though, and you can't see anything unless you light a candle by hitting the fire button. That only illuminates a tiny area around you, and a gust of wind could come along and blow the candle out. Of course, there's spooky things in the haunted house that will chase you down and kill you if they catch you. There are items in the house that can help you unlock new areas or avoid enemies, but you can only carry one thing at a time, and that includes the urn. When you find another piece of the urn, it just gets stuck onto it. And there's a bat similar to Adventure that will carry off items and scatter them around the house. So at higher difficulty levels, this is a trickier task than it seems. As an adventure game, Haunted House is pretty limited, but it is easier to understand and get into than the other adventure games on the 2800. Yars Revenge is often pointed to as the greatest VCS game, so it's only natural that Atari would bring it to the 2800. I like the game a lot, but I don't love it that much. The concept is that you're a space fly and you're trying to destroy the monster that's always on the right hand side of the screen. It has a shield that you can shoot through, or you can eat through. While you're doing this, you're constantly being pursued by a missile that homes in on you, and the monster will periodically turn into a swirly thing and shoot out to kill you. The monster can only be hurt by your own super missile, which you get by eating one of the shield or touching the monster. So there's some trade-off there where you can shoot your way through the shield very quickly, but then it makes it riskier to get your super missile. Or you could chew your way into the shield and hopefully bullseye that womp rat. The strip down the middle of the screen is a safe zone where you can't be hurt, but you can't shoot either. There's a lot of risk and reward in Yars Revenge, and I think that's what makes it a popular game. There's plenty of different ways to approach it, though I've always found it a bit on the easy side. Back when I could always answer yes to have you played your Atari today, I basically couldn't lose while I was playing Yars Revenge. I always felt that the game just wasn't really aggressive enough. Vanguard is the 2800's technical showpiece. The amazing game that nobody had anything like. A shoot 'em up that would scroll both horizontally and vertically, had tons of enemies on the screen, played music when you became invincible, and let you fire in four directions. It even had multiple stage layouts, both in terms of the terrain that you're flying through and the order that the terrain appears in. This is another case of Atari giving the game a separate Japanese title, Sento Butai, which, if you take the individual parts, could mean squad that leads the way. Vanguard is one of the better looking games for the system, but I always felt it was kind of clunky in play. Your ship just moves too slowly, and the screens aren't really able to scroll very well. And unlike Defender, they can't really mask that. It is the kind of thing that you'd want out at launch to be a system seller, it's just there's also a reason why people don't talk about Vanguard anymore. Berserk is one of the more disappointing VCS ports. I can understand why Atari decided to bring it out for the 2800, it was a new hot game at the time, but this port is pretty rough. You get points by shooting robots, and that's really the whole game right there because you can wander freely around rooms, you don't have to clear them out before you leave, you just shoot the robots. If you have the correct difficulty settings on, then an evil smiley face will show up and chase you around, but you still just run to the next room and shoot more robots. One of the limitations here is that only one robot can shoot at a time, and they tend to lock themselves into a rapid fire pattern, which is either annoying, as they won't let you move at all, or ineffective as one of them is shooting from behind a wall as you pick off all of his friends. And because of the gap in the player sprite, the robots can even shoot through you. The only other hazard is the maze itself because touching any of the walls will kill you instantly. This is a game that just doesn't have the high energy of the arcade original. Yep, here it is. One of the most infamous games ever created and Atari thought it was a great idea to bring it out for the 2800. Well, they had plenty of extra cartridges sitting around, I guess. Of course, there's a lot of lore that built up around E.T. that doesn't match reality. It actually did sell relatively well, at least in the U.S. And as obtuse as the game can be, it wasn't something really out there for the time either. The outsized reaction to it over the years 
has resulted in a lot of people going back and revisiting E.T. and going, oh, this is a fine game. And those people are wrong. I can tell you that even back in 1983, kids hated this one. This was the VCS's Bart vs. the Space Mutants. It sold because of the popular license, but it was an incredibly unfun game that went out of its way to prevent you from having any fun. The goal is to collect the three pieces of the phone, and then phone home, which will start a timer, and at the end of which the spaceship will return to the forest to pick up E.T. On the way, there's a government man who will take E.T. away, or steal parts of the phone, and E.T. has to deal with a dwindling power gauge, as all of his abilities, such as teleportation, causing parts and pits to glow, and flying, use up his energy quickly. E.T. is a frustrating game to play, frustrating to control, and doesn't even really use the license well. I'm well aware of the time pressures that the creator was under when he created it, but at the end of the day, this is the game we got, and the game we have to judge the results by. And those are all the launch titles for the 2800, but the catalog that came with the system promised more games to come, and a second wave arrived on November 15th, 1983. This block of 2800 releases consisted of just six games, and I'm going to kick those off with Battlezone. The original arcade version of Battlezone was another game that used a vector graphics system, and there it drew an entire battlefield of tanks, missiles, and terrain that you'd have to drive a tank around. It's something that would be impossible to recreate on the 2800 hardware, but it would be equally impossible to have giant sprites driving around on the 2600 hardware. And here we are. The secret is that everyone has some really limited ranges of motion. But even if they're using that, it's still amazing that they managed to get Battlezone on a VCS. And it plays relatively close to the arcade. It's not perfect, it doesn't have the two-stick control, and the action isn't nearly as smooth. Still, as far as a shooting gallery goes, this is very technically impressive in 1983. We've got more real sports with real sports tennis. Tennis is going to be a popular genre with all of the new consoles hitting Japan in 1983, and real sports tennis actually stacks up to them pretty well in terms of how it plays. You only have one button for knocking the ball back, so there isn't a separate lob and smash option, but you can manage that by how close you want to play to the net. Hit it close and they might not have a chance to respond? Far back and you'll get a chance to respond, but they'll have more time to respond as well. Where real sports tennis fails is where most of these 2800 games fail. It just doesn't stack up graphically with the new tennis games that were coming out. The characters were smooth and had decent animation, but they weren't as high of resolution as other characters. Which, when you consider how low resolution those sprites are in 1983, that's saying something. Real Sports Tennis is still a decent tennis game to play, it's just no match for Nintendo's tennis, which will be out less than two months later. Galaxian is another demonstration of Atari taking a big swing for that Japanese market. It's right behind Space Invaders for games that could pull people into the system. Namco's arcade shooter was best known for its colorful sprites. They'd pop in and start dive-bombing the player. This version of Galaxian greatly scales down the quantity of enemies that you'd face, but as far as compromises go to keep the game playing smoothly, that's a pretty good one. And unlike Atari's Space Invaders, the enemies in Galaxian are all recognizable as their arcade counterparts. Atari's advantage in having Galaxian wouldn't last them very long. Namco would port Galaxian themselves to the Famicom in 1984, and Namco's support for that platform was one of the keys that made it so big. This port's a pretty good effort for such weak hardware, but it was never going to be able to stand up to that. Another popular game from a popular Japanese arcade manufacturer. Taito's behind the original Jungle Hunt, or Jungle King to use the original title, before they were sued by the Edgar Rice Burroughs estate. This was both a new arcade game since it was released in 1982, and a new VCS game since the port was from 1983. Again, Atari was not half-assing it with their game selection for the 2800. 
The game itself has essentially four mini-games. First you swing on ropes, definitely not vines per the lawsuit. Then you swim through a river with crocodiles, where you can stab some of them if their mouths are closed. Then you have to jump over or dodge rocks that are bouncing towards you. And finally you have to avoid the unfortunately drawn natives. This is a significant step down from the arcade, with several important aspects either downplayed or entirely missing. But it's a good representation of the experience, which is mainly what you're getting from these ports of arcade games. I saved the worst real sports game for last. Real sports soccer is the bottom of that line. It neither plays well, nor represents its game well. If you have control of the ball, then hitting the fire button will kick it in the direction that you're pointing, and otherwise it swaps between one of the three fielders that you can see. Rather than represent the whole team, you can run off the left-hand side of the screen and reappear on the right. And since everyone moves at the same speed, that's the only way to catch up with someone who's gotten ahead of you. It also means that if you've got control of the ball and they're on top of you, then you can't break away at all. There are no goalies, you just shoot vaguely towards where the center of the left-hand side of the screen is. Real sports soccer is confusing, trickier to play than it should be, and all around a bad one. The final game for this wave of 2800 releases is Pole Position, a much better driving game than Night Driver which we saw before. This is a port of Namco's smash hit driving game, and due to licensing, this was the only Japanese console release for Pole Position for a very long time. Since this is the original Pole Position, there's only one track, which sounds an awful lot like the original Ridge Racer now that I think about it. The interface is a little bit confusing, as the car accelerates automatically, then the fire button brakes, and hitting up and down switch gears. Still, it's functional, and it only takes a few minutes to get used to. The game is played with a joystick rather than a steering wheel or paddle controller. It's not difficult to do a corner well, though. The biggest challenge is in how the opposing cars move. Nintendo's clone of Pole Position wouldn't be out for a full year, so Atari had the console racing game genre all to themselves for a while. That's it for the second wave, but there was one more wave of releases for the 2800. These don't have an exact release date beyond sometime in December 1983, and it is solely the three Sesame Street games that were created for the VCS. These games use the Kids Controller, which was just the Star Raiders pad scaled up a lot with bigger buttons. And while the games presented themselves as educational, it's really dubious that there was any educational content here. First up we have Alpha Beam with Ernie, or Ernie no ABC Uchusen, which can be roughly translated as Ernie's ABC Spaceship. You move around and match the character with the gap in the spaceship, and that's it. It's barely a pattern recognition game. Next up is Cookie Monster Munch, or Musha Musha Cookie Monster. Musha Musha being the onomatopoeia of Cookie Monster devouring cookies. In this game, you walk around the maze, collect the cookies, and return them to the jar at the bottom of the screen. Then it counts up the cookies that you returned. There's no opposition or anything like that. At least this one demonstrates counting, which makes it more educational than Alpha Beam. Finally, we have the totally non-educational, but actually a little bit playable, Big Bird's Egg Catch. Or Big Bird no Tamago Catch. Here you move Big Bird back and forth, and your goal is to catch the falling eggs in the nest on his head. As the game progresses, the paths that the eggs go down become more windy and complex. And if you catch enough consecutive eggs, then a golden egg comes down and it's worth extra points. It does count up the eggs at the end of a round, but if you're doing well, that can go by pretty fast. Of the three Sesame Street games, this is the only one that's worth even looking at. If you're curious about how that Sesame Street license did in Japan, the show had been on the air there since the 1970s, and it even had a bit of a wider audience from people trying to learn English. Now that's all of the games that were released for the 2800, but there were three games that were announced, had packaging and manuals printed for them, but were never released. Moon Patrol was going to be part of the second wave, 
and in support of Irem's arcade game where you drive your moon buggy fast, shoot up flying saucers, and jump over holes. It's a pretty good, though graphically scaled down rendition of the arcade game. It has all the courses, A to Z, and all of the enemies with their distinctive behaviors. For all of these unreleased games, the most likely reason is that Atari didn't have a license to release that game in Japan. In this case, coming from Irem and with no other ports of Irem games here, it seems likely that they just couldn't reach a deal. Joust is the more mysterious one. Williams had a good relationship with Atari, and other Williams games were released. The packaging gave Joust a new Japanese title of Tobi Tori Senshi, or Flying Bird Warriors, which is probably the best of all the new titles. This is the game where you mash the fire button to flap up and down and try to get above your opponents, knocking them off their birds and turning them into eggs. Famously, Nintendo had HAL Laboratory make a Famicom port of Joust to try to convince Atari to distribute the Famicom in the US. I doubt there was a connection between that and this game not being released in Japan, though. That port was made in 1984. So this one's really mysterious on why it wasn't released. And finally, the very last game to talk about is the infamous port of Pac-Man. And in this case, the infamy is kind of unfair. While it wasn't a very good port of Pac-Man, obviously, the maze isn't great, the noises are all shrill and painful to listen to, and it controls terribly. But it's the visuals that people usually latch on to, and that's really not that bad. That's the type of compromise that players in 1983 would have come to expect from a home port of a popular arcade game. With that said, look back at the previous 36 games. We've seen a lot of arcade ports, and most of them didn't match the original version especially well. But there were plenty of them that were still fun despite that, because they worked well with the limitations of the platform. And for 1983, this version of Pac-Man was just disappointing rather than something to be reviled. You'd play it and go, yeah, I can see Pac-Man there, but it's not the game I love. Even back then, my preference was for other Maze Chase games on the VCS, but there wasn't a single game in that style released on the 2800, unless you want to count Berserk, and I wouldn't. And that wraps up the tour of Atari's attempts to break into the Japanese market. Atari would make one more serious effort to break into Japan, and that was with the portable console, the Lynx. But that platform also didn't do especially well. Going in, I was thinking that the 2800 was a bad faith effort. An attempt to dump overstock on a foreign market during a time when the company's fortunes were rapidly going downward. Why didn't they release the 5200 in Japan instead, for example? That system at least could compete with all of the other 1983 platforms. But working my way through the library, I kind of get it. The VCS was a mature system in 1983, and people were making a lot of good games within the limitations of that platform. And I get the impression that Atari really did try to figure out what would work in Japan and sell that. Okay, they didn't work out how to translate their titles into Japanese properly, but considering how much English was on the package, I suspect they were trying to lean into being computer hardware from the US. I don't really think Atari could have done any better with the 2800 library. What it really comes down to is the system was twice as expensive as the competitors, and was six years behind the technological curve. They might have figured out a few tricks for their system that would take everyone else a little bit longer to work out, but that would have only bought them a year tops. It was a good effort on Atari's part, but I'm afraid it was doomed from the start. 